interesting. Uh, I will say I turned 40 last year, and 40 has been very interesting to me, right? I won't say anything for my wife, but I say that I began to experience aches and pains and differences uh, in movement and the ability to move. And in the last, uh, I guess in this last week or two, we've been dealing with some, uh, for me anyway, I've been dealing with 40 we. in a huge way. We. And so that's why we're coming down the stairs kind of like, all right, we're going we're gonna to get there because Very things slowly. have not been working uh, the way that we want them to. I know, isn't it, Miss Maxine, come on. I mean, I did, if 40 is not old, it should not be this way. We no. should not be breaking down already. But... <laughs> I'll tell you, in the last two weeks, it has not been fun uh, in, in, in the Matthews but house. We're so. But we're we here, and God has blessed us Amen. because we were able to get up and move, right? Because I don't know about some of you, but the aches and pains of moving sometimes. And, and so here we are. <laughs> That's right. Right? We're here. Absolutely. We made it. We All right. So welcome to our whirlwind because that is exactly what we're doing. That's who we are. That is where we exist. We live in the whirlwind. Uh, if you haven't, um, if we haven't ever said that to you, now you know. <laughs> All right. And to, just to illustrate that, just to give you a little bit of background on Deidre and I, uh, I'm going to I'm going to illustrate the whirlwind for you. So we started dating um, moons ago. I'll say moons ago. And uh, when we were dating, we lived in the same state. So I was in Maryland and she was in Maryland. She's not from Maryland, no. okay? And so we met and we began dating, and at not too long after we began dating, we realized that, oh, she's on an internship uh, for college. She's going to be leaving soon. And so off she went, left from Maryland, went back to Florida, and now we've got this huge gap between the two of us. And in that time frame, I'm also running, I had started a business down in uh, Lorton, Virginia, of all places, and was working with uh, some friends, and we were doing well for the most part. Uh, but in that whirlwind, uh, things began to conflict. You know how it goes, right? And so I ended up breaking ties with the other founders of that company and uh, graduated from college at the same time and then uh, got a job, my first real job, and then was in the dot-com time. And you guys remember dot-coms if you do. If you don't, just understand that during the dot-com times, companies were starting and ending, and like just like that. So a company that had been around for a pretty long time just vaporized, and now I need somewhere to work. So, hey, think about it. I'm in Maryland. She's in Florida. What do you do? You get closer, that's right? right. Well, that would be the logical choice, that's but that's not what I did. No, it's not. So instead of us having a 700 to 800 mile difference between the two of us, I increased that to 3,600 and moved to California. That's right. So so imagine, right? So here we are now. We were thinking we were going to get closer, and then boom, we're now expanded way far away, trying to figure out how we were going to make this relationship work, continuing to talk, continuing to fly back and forth like maniacs, uh, seeing each other, all of that. However, dot-com was not over. So I'm in Silicon Valley, and things imploded yet again, and now I have no job, and now I don't know where I'm going. So what happens next, I say to this young lady who's still in college, still trying to graduate, still working on her master's degree, I say, you know what? This is what we should do. We should get married. That's right. <laughs> brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I have I nothing to give you. And then I said? She said yes. Wow. Logical. <laughs> It makes sense, right? Perfect doesn't sense. it? Absolutely. No, it doesn't. <laughs> because that was craziness. That was the whirlwind making our heads spin so much <laughs> that everything made sense at the time. And so we moved to Texas. We got married. A year later, we had our first daughter. And then we said, you know what? We don't have is enough to do. So we got into ministry. Yeah. So we joined with our home church, and both of us got into ministry, me on the men's ministry side, Deidre on the women's ministry side. We continued to flourish and see what God was doing. I began to preach during that time, and everything was starting to kind of come to an equilibrium. We were starting to get a nice rhythm going, but as you can tell, if you haven't been able to figure it out, 
the whirlwind is still going. So during that time, we came up to Maryland. We were visiting with family, and God spoke to us and said, it's time to leave Texas. And so we're both going, what do you mean it's time to leave Texas? And we're saying, okay, well, we'll go back. We'll make a plan. We'll figure this thing out. We'll, you know, sell our house. We'll try and figure all the, all the points, right? And then, boom, I get back to Texas. That next week, we get back on a Sunday, Monday morning. I find out I'm getting laid off. And it's like, oh, God meant early the next morning. <laughs> And so that's what we did. We began packing our house. We had a big party. We told people, come and get whatever was here. We no longer want it. We don't want to take anything. So if it's still here, Deidre and and, and Isana at the time went on up to Maryland to my parents' house, stayed there, began looking for work. Uh, I was still in Texas trying to figure out what am I going to do at this house. And uh, I said to my friends from our former church, I said, hey, guys, I've got a whole bunch of stuff that's sitting in this house. I need it to be gone. And I'm leaving. So my cousin came down. He visited with me. We packed the stuff that we were taking in the car. We left. House was still sitting there. We had no idea what we were going to do. Up to Maryland, living with my parents, trying to live life, right? We join a church. We're worshiping. We're serving. Well, we're, we're, we're not really serving yet because we're still trying to figure that out, right? We'll find a job. That's okay. Oh, yeah. We find a jobs. job. That is important. Having it's work and being able to have a roof over your head. <laughs> and then, boom. Child number two comes along. Now we've got a really interesting situation because we've got two families living in the same house trying. Deidre and I are still within that early part of marriage, right? We're trying to make it work, okay? And we're also trying to make it work with our parents or my parents who had been married for many years, and they had their own rhythm. And two whirlwinds at the same time create a shearing force, right? So we had to figure out, where we were going, off we went. We went on, we found a place, and then what happens? We get into ministry again. Sure. We join a church, we begin serving, uh, me on worship, then ultimately as an associate pastor, as uh, Donnie mentioned this morning, and we continue to serve and go in the whirlwind. Jobs change, uh, family losses, new places to live. Everything is happening, 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 and then... Uh, we have a new baby. So because, of course, as God knows, because for our, from our perspective, we felt as though God had told us we weren't having any more children. We were certain we were not having any more children. We were 10 years out from our previous child, the child older, right? And then, boom, there we are, new baby. And we understood. But see, at that point, we understood. And that's the thing that I want to get across to everybody is that, Our life is not different. It's not special. Our life, it's life. Everybody has a whirlwind. The question is, are you trying to escape it? Or are you trying to figure out how do you live in it? And that's what we've done, or at least that's what we're attempting to do, is figure out how do we live life within the swirling cloud. That's how come we have a podcast that we do most weeks, and it's called Life in the Cloud, because that is exactly where we live in the middle, and not necessarily in the eye of the hurricane, right? But we're in, we're somewhere in there, not like directly in the wind, but kind of existing in that moment. And if there's one thing that I want you guys to take away from this today, as we're trying to make sure we stay within our time frame, right? Uh, What I want you to take away is that our lives, they're not new. What we're doing is not new. It might seem new. It might be different. But it's not new. Our God is a generational God, and he has a multi-generational vision. And so each one of us should reflect something similar. So that means that as God is doing things and as life is happening to us, that we would reflect out what we've seen and heard from him. So how do we illustrate that? Take a look at our first scripture. So in the book of Matthew, chapter 1, you've got a long list, genealogy, from Adam to Christ. It ends in verse 17 where it says, So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. 
That is a long vision. That is beyond a lot of people who were waiting for a Messiah and going, well, when is the Messiah going to come? When, Lord Jesus, come? When are you coming? When is it going to happen? But they persisted. They continued. Even when it fell silent. So you got that period there at the end of the Old Testament that rolls into the New Testament, and there's that 400 years where no one heard from the Lord. They still persisted believing that God was going to do a thing. So what are you doing that will live beyond you? Sure, some of us have children, right? Our children will live beyond us. Some of us might even have businesses that we've started or things that we're doing in industry or even nonprofits that we're using to serve other people. But what legacy will be left after you? What will, what will continue on when you're done? So have a, having a long view, not just, okay, what will my kids do when they grow up? But what will my great, great, great grandchildren do? What will their lives be like because of the choices that we've made? Because our lives are not our own, contrary to what the world tells us. Richard made that point clear last week. The world is telling us, It's about us. It's about me, what I want, my feelings, how I want to do things, everything that I want to do. I I don't like doing this thing, so I'm not going to do it. And if you tell me I have to do it, too bad for you. I'm walking. But that's not how it works. It's not how your life works. That is definitely not how marriage works. So I'm going to stop there because I've said a lot of words. And the interesting thing is I actually am excited because she's up here with me. Because we very rarely get to share the stage together. Uh, We have been in different places and spoken in different venues, but it's usually me over here doing this thing and her over there doing that. So I'm going to take my seat and let my wife jump in and talk about how different people enter our lives. Yeah. So, yes, different people do enter our lives. And, you know, we recognize that even before you get married, as you're a single, as as you're growing up, you know, your life matters before you get married, right? You're an individual person that has been created by God, that has gifts and purpose, and he wants to activate and do things in your life. And that's one of the things that um, Acton mentioned in our second week about how God is an initiating God, and he's a communicating God, and he communicates that purpose and that vision to you, and that we've got to begin to not um, look to our left or our right and compare our lives to others and really focus on, God and developing a relationship with him so that we know what his purpose and vision is for our lives because before you enter into marriage that matters because you are a person who matters and then when you do get married your lives to as you bring your life together with your partner uh, that union matters so it's not just two individuals going about their day giving the 50 50 <laughs> it's two people coming together giving that hundred percent and beginning to build their lives together so that they become one. And my family uh, makes fun of me because I'm a hand wizard and I like to (laughs) (laughs) use my hands. So as I'm, you know, communicating, that's what I'm doing. But even after, after marriage from the pulpit. Yes, I did. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Even um, our lives after our marriage matters, because in the vows, it talks about till death do us part and coming together to become one and um, having your relationship to just develop and to flourish, and it still makes a difference even when the unfortunate happens and your spouse is no longer with you. And I want to I piggyback on that to just say that beyond when, when, when you have that change happen, whether it's the change like uh, Richard and Vera mentioned last week of being empty nesters, or when you have that moment when you've lost a spouse, it, it's not over. It hasn't ended. Your time with your spouse was important, and the lives that you touched while you and your spouse were together, that mattered as well. And even beyond that, the lives that you'll touch when you uh, are free, I hate to say free, when, when, you're, when, when you've now got that time, when you now have that time to interact 
with other people that you might not have interacted with because you had the overhead of marriage. The same way that you wouldn't have interacted or done certain things when you had the overhead of young children. Those times matter. Because I know for us, we had uh, friends, we had family members, we had mentors that were around us that were hitting, well, I'll say for me, because I think Deidre did really well before uh, we got together. But for me, hitting me in the back of the head and saying, hey, Carlton, that decision you think you're about to make and you think is a good one, really not wise. And so those people, you, we all need them. We need each other. And so that's why I say it's critical. No matter what stage of your life you find yourself in, whether you're single, married, uh, after marriage, whatever that, wherever you find yourself, there is work to be done. Amen. So there's a co- few lessons that we wanted to highlight today of um, what we have learned and what we teach our children and what we teach our godchildren and Mm. other couples that come into our um, sphere of influence, I guess. Um, Lesson number one, heed the lessons and the warnings around you. And it's, it sounds simple and easy, but I think that it's not so simple and easy. No. (laughs) Because number one, it requires that you're paying attention to your life, Mm. who's in your life, um, what those people are doing in your life you know, in, in your marriage, what's going on and what's happening. But as even uh, coming here this morning, I was thinking about this particular lesson and in light of, in light of, (laughs) as parents, you know, and I'm speaking to the youth. Hello. How are you? Hi. Oh, they waved. Thanks. (laughs) So heeding, heeding the lessons and the warnings, you know, it sounds so very serious, but it's just, are you really paying attention to your life and to the friends that you hang around, I know it's difficult to pay attention to your parents because they're overbearing and they, you know, want you to do all of these things that are, you know, so difficult. But really paying attention to the fact that um, your family loves you, um, your friends, if you pick them wisely, they care about you, um, and paying attention to what's going on around you and looking for, number one, the lessons and the warnings, right, those red flags mm-hmm. that um, are coming at you. And so one of the scriptures that we picked um, for this particular illustration, and I'll let you read it, is Proverbs 1 and 7. Yeah. And the reason why we picked this one, if you've read the book of Proverbs before, if you haven't, as a teacher, I give you homework. Read Proverbs. <laughs> Proverbs is all about wisdom and finding wisdom. And in the very beginning, it's uh, in chapter 1, verses 1 through 6, it goes through, like, who should be seeking after wisdom and why you should be seeking after wisdom. And then in verse 7, which should be up there behind me, tells you what is going to be the the, the start of knowledge. And it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And it gives you a warning. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now, we were just talking to the youth, and I want to give the the youth a shout-out because what I'm learning, now that I have a teenager, uh, is that some of the things that I've said over the years that we tend to repeat over and over and over again, I'm beginning to hear them. I'm beginning to hear things come back. And my, and my teenager uh, actually told me that she hears and listens to about 75%. And I consider really? that a victory. That's awesome. Now, what I did, what I 75%? will say. 75%? Now, Three-fourths? I, listen, I pushed back because I did not feel that 75 was a good number because I felt as though that was way high because I just, you know, just – just watching it, I think it's probably closer to 68, 68 to 70. But she really pushed it, so we kind of landed on 72. So either way, that's I'll a good it. number. I'll take it. And here's the reason why. is because as a parent, you're repeating things a lot. So it's volume. It's a volume game. Play the, <laughs> the, the magic of large numbers, guys. Just continue to say the things you need to be said over and over and over again. Because eventually those things land. But they've got to hear them over and over and over again. They've got to understand that wisdom is calling out to them in the streets, like it says in Proverbs. They've got to hear that fools despise wisdom and instruction. They've got to hear that things are happening. And on top of that, so not to keep saying things about the youth, as adults, we need to hear the word of God over and over and over again. We need to hear wise counsel over and over and over again. We need to hear from each other over and over and over again. 
Because the way that our minds work, our minds love the status quo. New things are actually painful for your brain. Your brain wants to ignore new stuff. That's why it's so hard to get up and start a new thing. Because your mind is saying, no, we're good. I'm comfortable right here. I don't want to add anything else. And that's why it takes so long to create a new habit. Because your brain fights you every time. Think about it. I'll put myself on the pedestal right now. Okay? You see this right here? This gut has been here for a very long time. I used to run triathlons. It's still there. Because my mind loves food. I love eating. I love to eat so much that I learned to cook excellently. I've taken classes. I've learned to cook other uh, international cuisine. I've learned to cook from different countries because I love food. I make friends who are from different countries because I want to know what they eat. I want to go and I want to have it. I want to try it. I want to experience it. And this is the result. But I tell myself every day, okay, today, Carlson, you're going to get it together. You're going to get up. You're going to plan your meal. You're going to have your breakfast. You're going to have your lunch. And I do so well. Breakfast, I've got it set up. I take, it to, I take a week's worth of breakfast to work and put it in the fridge. Because if I don't, I'm stopping for bagels. I'm stopping for whatever it is that I want to eat that morning. Lunchtime, I pack in my lunch. I got it. I take it with me when I go to work. But as soon as I leave work and I got to go home, nobody's around to see what I'm eating. I eat everything, anything I can find, whatever tastes good. Because in my mind, I'm fighting against it. So some days are better than others. And every day gets a little bit better. But I'm telling you, the battle against your mind is real. It's a real thing. So heed those lessons. So that was for free. That was not part of the message. No. So let's get back I'm to marriage, okay? Notes. So it's definitely not here in the notes. <laughs> so things that we've learned and things that I've learned particularly about marriage, things that were told to me or I saw or things that I've experienced. Number one, marriage is permanent. I know in our uh, no-fault situation, our culture, our, our, our ideas about marriage, everything says that your marriage should be, um, you know, it, it's kind of... It's casual. Yeah, it's casual, like we said last night. It's casual. <laughs> marriage is casual. It's like, ah, uh, you know, we'll just do this thing for five years, right. and re-evaluate. we'll reevaluate it in five, and then decide if we want to keep going. And I'm telling you, don't go into it with that mindset, because you will find a way out. Because marriage is like that habit, right? Your brain is going, no, this new person wants you to be different. This new person wants you to do things that you don't want to do, or wants you to change in ways. But marriage is permanent. When you get into it, it is. Till death do you part. Number two, marriage is difficult. It requires effort and hard work. Hard work required. Yes. Requirement for marriage. Because you like you. You like the things that you like. Okay? Your spouse likes themselves. And your spouse yes. likes what they like. And now you've got two people with sometimes diametrically opposed likes. And now you've got to figure out how do you make life work together? You know, here's a. And that's the hard work. That is the hard work. Coming to the middle. So I think a classic illustration for me is that um, when I grew up, we folded the towels in a square. (laughs) (laughs) You know, you get the towel, you get it over here, over here, nice square. All the same size, sheets, square, the fitted sheet, learn how to fold a fitted sheet, and a square, you line them up in the towel closet, it's beautiful, you close the door, it's great. Um, Carlton doesn't do that. (laughs) And I was taking too long with the sheets one day, he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, what do you mean? I'm folding the sheets, this is how you fold the sheets, and you, right? So no. So he takes the sheets, he's like, this is how you do it. He's just like, just, just, just throw it in there. And then the man, towels, man, and then the towels are rolled. Correct. Who rolls a towel? Oh, okay, rolled. Who okay. rolls you a towel? Roll. I don't understand. So we've come to a compromise where, um, you know, in my home when I was growing up, my uh, stepfather was from the military, and so that's why the sheets needed to have the hospital corners, and you need to bounce the quarter off, and you had to fold them all the same size, and you had to, right? So my, of course, my mother I'm, was like that too. I'm bringing that. 
but I I listen to my parents. So I bringing that <laughs> with me into adulthood. Valid. Right. Valid. Right. So Valid. I I brought that with me into adulthood, and so but anyway, so instead of but but Carlton has helped me to realize to not stress myself out, right. Just get it in a situation that works, right? Which now I rolled the towels. It's fine. We stick them in there. He he built me a laundry hamper or laundry, what is it called? Organizer That's situation, right. I, right. whatever you call it. It's beautiful. You First roll thing things built. up, you stick it in there, you push the baskets in, and nobody can see how messed up they are. So that means that Man, when I teach they, my children, no, no, no. I'm not going to let that stand. No, I'm not going to no, let no, that no. stand. Listen. The towels are in there. They're rolled up in a nice little pyramid in the basket. When you need a towel, you go into the closet, you pull the basket yes. out. You take the towel out, you Absolutely. go to the bathroom. That's no, correct. It's not like they're just thrown in there no, in like not. a, a, well, like a mat. Well, so I'm not going to let that no, stand. No, no. no. Listen, no, listen if you let me finish, you would have said, heard me say that that means that as we have taught our children how to do the sheets and the towels, right, mm -hmm. which they will not do consistently the same every time, and that's okay because they go inside that basket and you close the thing and you can't see it. That's right. Right? So they still learn how to do things that they need to do, right? Mm -hmm. And it just won't look like the way when I grew up when it was pretty. It's okay. You keep, you it's keep okay, going it's back done. to pretty. You keep going beautiful. back to pretty, but I'm it's not fine. sure. So we worked it out. That's so we point. So we say that, right, and we laugh about it <laughs> because that leads us into number three thing, the third thing that we've learned. Marriage is fun. Yes. There is a lot of fun in marriage, even in these difficult moments where we're like arguing about towels and sheets and how to put things in, the, cl in the drawer, toothpaste, socks, toilet seat cover, up, down, all that stuff, right? Dishes. You, there's all kinds of things. Dishes, pots, dust. pans, dust. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm against dust, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm also against getting the dust. So, <laughs> but marriage is fun. It is a good time, even in the difficult moments. Mm -hmm. It is fun. And we want yeah. people to understand that. I mean, I, I one of my mentors, um, you know, they had, um, he would talk about the early days of their marriage. And it wasn't, it was not a good time. Um, and the two of them had a lot of struggles going on. And, but as they got older, as they got, or I should say he, got a little more mature. And his wife uh, continued to stand with him and continued to work on him. Um, he began to understand what was more important, um, which was his marriage and not his own desires and things that he wanted mm -hmm. to do. And the two of them had a, a beautiful marriage all the way until, um, you know, he passed away um, a few years back and then she joined him. Um, but the, the thing that he was always stressing to me was the rewarding nature of marriage. And so that's number four. Marriage is rewarding. And my parents, I think, also were a really good indicator of this. It was Amen. rewarding. They enjoyed each other, even in difficult moments, even when they didn't want to talk to each other, even when we could tell, my brother and I, that there was something going on. They still laughed. They still ate dinner together. They still uh, watched common shows, TV shows together. They understood that even though I might not like you right now, uh, we are in this thing, and we appreciate it. And as they got older, they began to, uh, you could see it. Everybody could see it. The neighborhood could see it. The other neighborhood kids could see it. People who knew them and know them now understood it, that they enjoyed each other. Their marriage was one that was truly rewarding. Amen. All right, and so as I'm looking at the clock, we're going to continue moving, and we're going to go quick. All right, so I want everybody to be ready. All right, because we're going to move a little bit fast now. So what you have learned, lesson number two, what you have learned is not just for you. So I just shared with you guys all the things that I've learned or we've learned from people around us about marriage. And the reason why we share that with you is because that information was not just for us. It was not just because someone wanted our marriage, individual marriage, to be better. It wasn't just because someone wanted to help prepare us for the task of being married. It was because they knew that the same way that God's story echoes on and on and on, these ideas about marriage need to echo on and on and on. And so here we are sharing those things with you. Because the church, right, so we're here in church, the church <laughs> has all of its needs met. 
I know we don't always feel that way. There always seems to be a difficulty. There's a, a lack here or a lack there. But if we all take care of each other, there is no lack in the church. Amen. And if we take a look at the book of Acts, chapter 2, thank you, Rich, verses 42 through 45, we have this. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Now, we're Americans. And so there is an idea that we have as a culture that we're rugged individualists. We do it ourselves. We pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, which if you really think about it, is not possible. You cannot pull yourself up by your boots. If you don't believe me, when you get home, put on a pair of boots, sit on the floor, pull yourself up. It's not going to work. We need each other. As a body of believers here at Renovate Life Church, we need each other. As parents, we need other parents in our lives. As the youth, you need other youth in your lives. As parents, we need to connect with the youth because we need them in our lives to understand yes. life. Because we get so wrapped up in our own stuff that we miss it. And they're seeing things that we're not. So on the other side, youth, you need your parents. You need the Amen. next generation, the one that was before you and the one before them. Because they've seen things that you're not prepared for. Amen. Okay? And we need each other. When we have needs, somebody needs to know. Because there's someone here who has the answer to your need. Because God put them here and put you here and said your needs would be met. So that means that when you have a struggle, when you have lack, there's someone in the church that is there to meet that need for you. There is a believer that has the answer to what you are seeking. Amen. Because God has brought them there for such a time as this. Amen. And in Acts, we see that the gospel spread that way. It spread house to house, family to family. People heard the word, were empowered by the Holy Spirit. They gathered together. They shared the word. They were empowered by the Holy Spirit. They went out. They shared the word again. And the houses grew and the believers grew. And more people were connected because God was doing a work through the people in each other's lives. And that's why we share our stories. That's why we share our lives with you like we're doing right now. That's why we share our life on our podcast. Deidre gets on my case. Sometimes she says I might overshare. I do. I'm not going to lie. I do. I share a lot on social media. I share a lot with the people that I come into contact with. When I am working with a couple, sometimes I share more than they might be comfortable with. But the point of that sharing is that they understand your trouble you are not the first person to have had that problem. Amen. You are not the first person to struggle in that way. And I want you to understand there's someone that I might not have the answer to how to fix it. But what I can do is I can stand with you together. We can pray about it. We can seek Amen. the Lord for that answer. We can seek the Lord that you can connect with your spouse in a greater way. Right. Amen. And so renovate life church as a small microcosm of God's church, right, his bride, we should be meeting the needs of each other. That's why you have to see each other day in or week in and week out. Like we come here on a Sunday because you've got to get past the veneer. Amen. Everybody's OK. Say hi to somebody and say, hey, how are you? I'm fine. I'm OK. Everything's great. If you go to some holy churches, I'm blessed and highly favored. <laughs> I'm blessed. The Lord is keeping me. The Lord has me up. The Lord has me. I'm, I am flying. And then when you start talking on Monday or Wednesday, and they're like, man, I was, my, my wife, my kids, my finances, I'm about to get laid off. But then you come on a Sunday morning and everything's fine. It ain't fine. That's true. And it's okay for it not to be okay for it not to be 
Whenever we counsel, one of the things we always do is we tell a couple, do not be afraid of the stigma of telling people that you're hurting, telling people that you have difficulty, going to see a third party, whether it's coming to a pastor like Donnie or us or going to a, you know, a counselor, like a, a certified counselor. Don't be uh, have that thing where it's like, well, you know, I, I should be able to make it get through this on my own. Let me button myself up and just kind of push my way through. No, sometimes you need a disinterested third party. I mean, I'm not afraid to say that Deidre and I have been to counseling. We went to premarital counseling. We've been to postmarital counseling. We sat with a counselor that didn't have anything to do with the church. And the good thing about it is that sometimes you just need to hear yourself say something that's ridiculous. <laughs> right? Again, not Deidre, me. Okay? You need to hear yourself say something ridiculous. And then you go, oh, wait, that's, that's crazy. I, am, I have an unreasonable expectation. Like in week one with Donnie and Renee, right? You've got these bags that you carry around, and you've got these ideas of what your marriage should look like, and you never even examined whether or not it made sense. So do it quickly. Don't wait until the problem starts to then start seeking help. Because, I mean, you should still seek help if you're in the moment, right? But start before that so that you can get coping mechanisms, so that you and your spouse can kind of learn how to live life together. Amen. Oh, okay, Amen. nothing for me. All right, <laughs> so last thing that we have here are six things that um, have worked for us, principles that we have learned and teach. Uh, the first one is to focus and develop a relationship with God. Um, we found that in our situation as well as in the situations with couples, right, if you spend time focusing on God, getting closer to God, what you will find is that you get closer to each other. I don't know what it is. It's a byproduct, but it happens. It's almost as if the closer you get to God and the closer that your spouse gets to God, eventually you guys meet somewhere around here, right? Because the closer you, the more you focus in on what God is doing, the more you focus in on who he is, the more you focus in on his, like for me, the more I focus in on, this is God's daughter, so God, you know how to best relate to her. How can I relate to her? Then I begin to relate to her better. And she does the work on the other end. Amen. God, how do I talk to that man? You know him. You know what he's at, how he acts. You know what he's about. And then we get closer together. Yeah. My favorite one is number two. Yeah. I tell us to every couple that I meet, your spouse is not your enemy. They're not your enemy. You married them for a reason. They are not your enemy. No matter what. No matter the situation or the circumstance. Now, I always have to caveat that and say, I want you to be safe. I've worked with couples, wives and husbands, that are in situations that are generally not safe. If you find yourself in a situation that is not safe for you to exist in, then number two is not applicable. Yes, your spouse is your enemy. They are actively trying to harm you. It is okay for you to take a step back and make sure that you're safe. Okay? I say that strongly because there are folks who have these ideas in their head that I'm supposed to let my spouse beat on me. You are not. Man or woman, you are not to ever have a spouse who puts their hands on you. If you are unsafe, you need to solve that first. Amen. And God knows that he doesn't want you to be unsafe. Amen. Sorry. Number three. Let me, let me give you a break. Take thank, a you, thank you. Thank you. Because I'm sorry. I, I, that one is like, that hits me yeah. so hard. Because I have had to have that conversation with a spouse that was in that moment. And I'm going, listen. I need you to get out of this situation. Get away because it's not safe for you. Well, the Bible says that I'm supposed to love my husband. Yes, you are. Respect your husband. Yes, you are. But you're also supposed to not die. Amen. You're not there to die so that your husband can be saved. That's not how this works. 
Okay, and I've had that conversations with husbands that felt as though it was important to put their hands on their wives. It's not. Okay, and I have no problem letting you know that it's not. Same way that I overshare my own life, I will let you know when you get out of pocket. Amen. Okay. So the third lesson that we've learned is that only one of us can be crazy at one time. <laughs> and that's just because if two people are crazy at the time, it just doesn't work. We just It doesn't work well. We've learned that this doesn't work well. So it, we actually ran into a situation last week where one of us just kind of was not having a good day and it was not going well. And at, I had to take a step back. Right? It's your turn to Again, be crazy. Me. It's okay. <laughs> Take a step back. It just makes the situation not uh, get volatile and, and heated, and it just creates damage that we don't want to create because we've lived through yeah. damage that is not pleasant. Uh, number four is my favorite. Have a budget. <laughs> not <laughs> Review it and change it. I know. Yes. He's As you overshare, you like to – you're a spender. You are. That's right. I am not. And so <laughs> – we just balance each other out, and we um, having a budget helps to keep the boundaries around finances, which can be a primary driver of you know marriages not working and causing a lot of conflict. So we have a budget. We generally stick to the budget, and we when we don't, we review it, and then things need to be changed. Things need to be changed, and we also make sure Carlton doesn't have too much money in his wallet at one time. <laughs> My three just ladies make sure of that all the time. He just doesn't need All it. Okay? I'm just kidding. And number five, fight fair. Um, we don't slander each other. So in terms of fighting fair, it's just having conflict resolution rules where we're not screaming, we're not yelling, we're not using bad words. We just fight fair. If there's a problem, we figure out a time, number one, to talk about it because um, – in the heat of the moment, when you're really upset and you're really mad, that's when you tend to just fly off and your mouth just goes and it, it just creates a situation that's not pleasant. And so we, I don't know that we necessarily say, okay, at this time we're going to talk about it, but the not now happens a lot. Yeah. Not right now. And we just. Yeah, and then we come back and we say, okay, now's the time to talk about Correct. that thing that was bothering us yes. earlier today. Correct. Exactly. And that's also timing because we can't have conversations late at night. It just doesn't work. No serious conversations after 9 p.m. You're Amen. tired. Amen. We just can't think straight. Just wait till the next day. Um, and number six, which is the most fun, is plan for fun. That's right. Um, plan trips, vacations, um, outings, ice cream. My goodness, how many times do you run out for ice cream? <laughs> I on Fridays, that's our fun. Oh, wait. Just, and it used just to be on easier. Just, just on, on Friday. Friday? Just on Friday. Oh, okay. It was easier when the kids were little because we all would just get the same ice cream. But now everybody has to have their own ice cream, which might require multiple stores. So he is such a prince charming to go so <laughs> slay the fun. dragons for ice cream. <laughs> so much fun, guys. So much fun. But again, uh, plan for fun because, again, marriage is fun. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, same thing with your budget, right? For those of you who are budgeting, and, 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 and it should be everybody, budget in your fun. Right. Yes. That way it does. It's not painful. Right. You know, you're not going, oh, no, we had fun and now we can't pay rent. Like, don't you don't want to be in that situation. Not so for plan right. for fun. All right. All right. So we're right at time and we're going to um, I want to stop and I want to pray with everybody. And I don't know Donnie's coming up, um, but I just want to let you guys know that none of this is new. None of these are new ideas. There are things that we've heard. There are things that you've heard. There are things that you've seen, you've read. These are just echoes of a story that's already done and already been started. And that is what we wanted to bring across to you guys is that you're, there's a wealth out there for you to plug into. This place, this church, these people, there are ideas for you. There are people for you. There are things for you. Your needs really can be met. Stop trying to do it on your own. Because we're family, and we should act that way. Amen. Amen? So, Father, we pray and we ask that you would continue to bless this place, that your word would be heard, that lives would be different, that we would come together as a family, that we would get beyond the veneer of okay and fine and pat answers, that we would begin really talking to each other. That we would begin seeking how we can be a blessing to the people around us. The same way that we love our families or we love our friends, we should love each other in the church. 
So, Father, we just stand knowing that you can do it, that you can bless us, that you keep us, and that you, God, are so very faithful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. So, don't, don't, don't notice their shirts. Those are great. Yeah, look, look at King and Queen. Look at that. <laughs> look, I want to know, do your kids have shirts that say, like, princess, or do they say, like, servants? But, I don't know. So, <laughs> so our daughters are both princesses. There we go. They both have their own okay. princess handle. Uh, and then the son is still the boy because he's still it's, too it's small still for the that. All right. Hey, help me thank Carlton and uh, Dietrich for being here. Thank you guys for sharing. Thank you. Yeah. Listen, th- this whole series has been, uh, you know, hopefully something that will, you know, if you're married, will better uh, your your marriage, will challenge you. If you're if you're not married, uh, you know, not married yet, it, it will give you uh, a sense of, you know, what to what to prepare for. Uh, but e- even if if you know you've been married or, and aren't married at the moment or whatever, there's a lot of things in here that are just principles for relationships in general. And so no matter where you're at, you know, hopefully God used something in this series to, to challenge you to speak to your heart. I, th- I think he has because I've been hearing some people talk uh, and mention different things about uh, a certain week that we've uh, we've talked about and, and different principles, uh, that thing. And so I, I know that you're thinking about some of those things, uh, but continue to do that. And, you know, today, you know, as we kind of wrap this series up, just pray that God would, you know, let you know uh, and convict you of one of these areas, uh, whether it's, you know, the expectations that you have or, or maybe you've, you've gotten too serious and, and there's unforgiveness and bitterness and you, you need to kind of get, get rid of that and get back to the enjoyment and the fun uh, of marriage or, you know, or, or whether uh, you, you need to, uh, you know, if you're in the silence, uh, you need to figure out, you know, how to go through that time in a healthy way. Or I like the questions that, that they posed earlier about the echo. You know, echo is just a continuation of sound. You know, how will your family, your future family's lives be impacted because of the decisions and choices that you're making? And you know, what's going to be your legacy? I mean, th- those are great things to be intentional about in our relationships. So uh, you know, th- thank you guys for that again, uh, Matthews, for, for sharing and wrapping that up for us. Um, Listen, before we go, we just want to give you a quick reminder about next week. And so uh, turn your attention to the screen. Blossoms everywhere because it's spring time. Springtime in the air, and that means day light. It's daylight saving time, which means you lose an hour. Lose an hour of your life. I was gonna say bedtime, but well, it makes more sense, I guess. If it's a six, move it to seven. If it's a seven, move it to eight. If it's a nine, move it to ten. If it's a ten, you're late. late. You're not going to make it on time. Yeah, I'd probably just go to Starbucks in my jammies or something. You still say jammies? No. Mm, Maybe. So next week, set your clocks forward, uh, and and don't forget to sign up to where you're going to serve day. You don't have to sign up to be a part, but signing up helps us figure out, you know, what kind of teams we have at different places so we can make sure that we're we're prepared, okay? Um, we mentioned earlier uh, about some things coming up. Uh, Doug, come in, anything else to say about uh, kind of our, our men's time coming up? I know Brian had touched base with you about that. So I wasn't in here since I was in child care earlier, so I don't know what was said earlier. But, okay. Um, there is a sign-up sheet out front, uh, so please sign up so we know how to plan for that. Uh, there will be prizes, so we need to know how many prizes we need. Uh, if you don't sign up, I'll take them. That's fine. Uh, but, yeah, we'll have uh, foosball, uh, ping pong, and cards and other games and food. And it's also the kickoff for March Madness that weekend, so there'll be basketball on. 
So uh, just come out, have a good time. We'll be done by 11, so you can still be on time for church. That's on, that, that's on a Friday night, right, or Saturday? Oh, Saturday, okay, Saturday. I think I said a week from Friday. So it's Saturday, guys, um, on March 17th uh, for the men's night. And also, uh, we had guys last time bring their bring their sons, like their uh, you know, the older sons, teenage sons with them. So you teenagers, uh, man, come with your dads, uh, or if your dad won't come, grab another, you know, another guy from around here and uh, say, hey, I'm going to kind of adopt you for the night or something. But All right, hey, thank you guys for being here. We'll see you next week.